Well, I uh, encourage you to open your Bibles to uh, where we're at. We've got a couple more weeks here in uh, 1 Thessalonians. It's been a great, uh, great look at the uh, snapshot of the church finding hope. Um, we start this morning with a, uh, a, a story of Oli and Sin. Okay, Oli and Sin are two pastors that have churches on the edge of town. And Oli is the pastor of the Norwegian Lutheran Church. And uh, Sven is the pastor of the Covenant Church just across the street, just across the road. And um, one day they are, uh, they've got a joint project. They're pounding a, a sign into kind of the, the, the place where both of their churches are. And the sign says this, the end is near. Turn yourself around now before it's too late. And so a car drives up and sees this sign, rolls down the window and says, Ah, oh, you Scandinavian religious kooks, when will you give up? And speeds off, and the next thing they hear is this screeching of brakes and a car going into a lake. And uh, Ole shakes his head and says, That's the third one this morning. <laughs> and... and Sven agrees, yeah, sure, do you think the sign should just say the bridge is out? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 my, my, my professors at uh, North Park would be glad that I was able to pull off a little bit of that Swedish bro. Yeah. Well, well, here's the thing. The, the, the whole message of the blessed hope has been often turned on its head. And that's really, uh, and, and Paul wants to right the ship. In fact, he's one of the few that, uh, you know, uh, is, is writing about this in the first century. But, but in our day, the, the message gets turned around. Um, the, the, the message easily becomes um, one of those messages like, here's the message of the blessed hope. Let's all figure it out and write the newest book and make the most money on our theories. <coughs> the other message that comes with this, and this may be a little more home to the rest of us, is, boy, God's going to come back and take care of you guys. Kind of like, I, I can remember uh, this message in my own home. When your father gets home... Now, that was very effective for Jeffy and Stevie at home, but we had this odd relationship with our father every time that was used. You know, it's not the right message. What is happening in terms of context from last week to this week is important. We do know this, that the events of the return of the Lord are always going to be anticipated with difficulty. Uh, and so almost at any age, depending on where you're at in the globe, it's suitable time for God to return. Amen? Like any, any time. So my question this morning is how does hardship bring encouragement and hope to us? How does the hardship of the crush of events do that? And the uh, answer is, it clarifies what's really important, doesn't it? When difficulty arrives, it clarifies. So here's my illustration. So when you're on a, a seven-day cruise ship going across the Caribbean, you wake up every day on that cruise ship going, oh, man, I wonder how much shrimp I'm going to eat today, or I wonder if they're going to, you know, what, what I'm, what I'm going to wear tonight to the, to the Bansy Fall, you know. Uh, what, what's going to happen, you know, uh, today? Are we going to go watch a movie or go bowling or jump off the ship and swim with the dolphins, all that? But the minute that ship runs aground, and all of a sudden, it's not a cruise ship, but it's a shipwreck. Everyone goes, oh, it's about my life. Right? So, so the difficulty clarifies the life thing for us. So here's the context. Last week, the context, as Paul was bringing it to us, was there were believers in the church that were neglecting their basic responsibilities because, oh well, Jesus is coming back. 
He'll be back by the end of the week. I'm not going to get a job or feed my children. Also, let's get a job. You know? Put in your hands. That's not the message. Oh, Jesus will just take care of it. The context this week, however, is Christians overly, and I, I can only emphasize that to the degree that our hearts can work with this, overly concerned and attached to the things of this world. So that in grief, they thought, oh, it's all up. Paul says, no, 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 it's just beginning. You see, life in this world is as a baby in the womb. And if that baby were given a chance, we'd probably just stay in the womb. It's nice, it's warm, I'm so close to the mother, I hear the heartbeat, I don't have to, you know, feed myself or breathe, she just does it all for me. And, and that's your life here on this earth. And God's going to kick us out into the, into the great eschaton, into that great day. And we're going we're gonna, to, a world we cannot even envision. Paul wants us to know of that hope. You see, the message of the blessed hope is in three things. That, uh, that become uh, really powerful this morning. So he writes, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who have fallen asleep or grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep. We're going to talk about the fallen asleep thing because... Paul uses several words. We're going, to, we're going to take that into next week, which is too much here. So we'll, we'll do the falling asleep thing. But for this passage, know that he's saying, for those who have died. For those who have died. The message of the blessed hope is in its reason. Okay? So let's talk about its reason from this passage. And there's, there's two reasons. Uh, the reason is, which brings present hope. Okay, there's a present hope that the church has to be involved in. And that present hope is God's got things for us to do until he returns. And that we are a, a living infomercial of the things that God wants to do. We are, our, our lives, our family, our work, uh, our involvements, our lifestyle, the world, and the lack of all those things. Our, our present sense that we are the bearers, the image bearers of Christ everywhere we go. Big, big responsibility. You know, it's, it's great when Maureen plays the piano. We can see that, we understand that, but just use that as an illustration and understand just kind of starting from Wendy there and going all the way across the room here. You all have a gift. Every single one of us have a gift of the Holy Spirit. God's saying, I want you to play your piano this week. I want people to hear that from you. Your piano is going to play for a crowd of people that have a fine-tuned ear to your gift. And it may just be driving civilly. <laughs> You know, it may just be handling that person that's just got to get in line in front of you at Marvell. Okay. <clears throat> Think about it. The present hope, and, and also, and obviously, is the future hope. This is not what we, we haven't bet the farm on this life, the chairs you're sitting in, and the clothes you're wearing, and even the families that you have. And all the difficulties connected to that. Don't lose sight. These are terrible times. We are, we are not on a cruise ship. We are on a shipwreck. So, so make that adjustment. You know, what did we expect? Paul and Jesus and Peter, they, they line up pretty close to these ideas together. What are we expecting? Were we expecting that when we came to Jesus, it would be a cruise ship? 
or that we would be riding the wave of the end of the age and how we might do that respectively. Paul, uh, Paul does this um, uh, for us, you know, in, in this wonderful verse out of, out of uh, Timothy. He says, for I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but to all of you who have longed for his appearing. I believe the King James says, who have loved his appearing. Wow. That might be a question for some of us this morning. Well, Jesus, don't come back quite yet. I, I, you know? I'm, I'm loving some of this other stuff. Do we long for his appearing? I love how Paul is not either involved in figuring out the appearing, hurrying up the appearing, using the appearing as a, as a manipulative force to get some poor soul to capitulate to Jesus under fear. Paul doesn't do any of that. He just, he's laying his life out there and he's saying, I am ready for this to happen. He goes from there. Uh, the message of the blessed hope is in its reason. It is also in its teaching. Look at verses uh, 15 to 18. And, and I love this. According to the Lord's own word, just stop right there. Paul's now going to tell you, he's not going to tell you how he does this, but he's saying, I'm going to now teach what Jesus teaches about his own second coming. I think we ought to sit up in our seats. Maybe if we read this, you know, right? We tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep or those who have died. So folks that have died, they're first in line. We'll talk a little bit about that. But that's a little bit crazy out there. So verse 16, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, all who are still alive and left will be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And I love this. Here's, here's Paul. It just, you know, and we. <laughs> He's identifying himself. He's saying, I think this is going to happen in my lifetime. And we will be with the Lord forever. And then the most important line of his eschatology is right here, verse 18. Most people miss this. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Don't make up words to encourage or incite fear in people's hearts. Encourage with these words. Actually, this stuff is really straightforward. It's amazingly simple. Three things here. One, verse 15, the Lord's coming back. The Lord's going to come. And he will return. And, and, and the faithful, and, 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 uh, uh, dead or alive, are with that. But then he says, there's, there's some importance here. Number two, verse 16, the dead will rise first. Those who have died first will rise first. But according to Paul and according to Jesus, Peter feels the same way if you want to get to 2 Peter chapter 3 with a bunch of other really cool stuff in there. Close behind are the living who will also be ready. And then verse 17. The living will be caught up together with Christ forever. Now I failed. I'll do this better in the next service. I sometimes I got to get warmed up on you guys. Sorry. 
I wanted to say before I even read this that if you could just wipe the slate clean. I did this one time with a Revelation Bible study, and I said, write everything that you know. You know, and then we put it all on a whiteboard. But we want to talk about this, and, and then so, so this book says this, and we wrote it all down. And we got to the end of Revelation, and hardly touched any of those things. They weren't in there. <coughs> they weren't in there clearly. This is what Paul says clearly is to happen on the final day. Verse eighteen is the most important verse. I, I, I would, I would, uh, I don't have much in my wallet this morning. <laughs> in fact, we left our tide check at home. Uh, it's been quite a uh, but, but here's the deal. I know Paul knows more than he's telling us. Paul in other places says, man, I was taken up into the seventh heaven. God showed me stuff. But you know what? He places none of that at our table. He says, I want you to be encouraged with what I just told you. And not a lot of fluff. And not a lot of stuff. And not a lot of drama. And not a lot of theology. I want you to hear this word. Whether this satisfies our curiosity or not, we're going there next. Is something that we have to straighten out. Why do we always make the most important things, the blessed hope, so confusing and out of reach of the garden variety Christian? I, I simply don't know. I simply don't know. One of my favorite professors in, in seminary, a uh, guy taught Old Testament, he says, he said, Jeff, someday people are going to call you Pastor Jeff. And he says, when you open the word of God to people. It has to be as clear as it was to some woman in the first century taking her camels down to the well for water. And if you have some kind of inordinate need to make this more intellectual or make this all about what you know and no one else knows, he says you're going to be ripping your people encouraging stuff. Jesus is coming like a thief in the night. He's going to take care of those who have died, and then he's going to take care of everyone else who's living. And bam, it's going to happen. Okay, so here's a little deal. I get called in to brief share. Okay, got a moment for this. You know, well, well, what's happening to the people that I love that are that, that are, have died in Christ? Are, are, they, you know, are they waiting in some kind of dark, creepy place? You know, until... And, and Paul says in, to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, and you're just going to have to trust this. It, just think with me for a moment how well all of us can figure out something like the resurrection. So think resurrection with what I'm going to tell you. You see, when someone dies, I believe and I think scripture supports this, that the next thing that's going to happen is, you know, if I pull out of this, this, uh, you know, this driveway and I'm not looking at the moving van that's coming, you know, up at 40 miles an hour, whoo, bam, Jeff's gone. Well, I, I you know, it, it, I don't know when the Lord's going to, but I know that my experience, because Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. My next experience, like a great night's sleep, ho! Oh, Goodness, we're in heaven. Maybe Gail survived the accident, and I'm looking down, and there, there she comes. And I'm looking up, and there goes Abraham Lee. Just a little bit ahead of me. And God does that in God's time, because he's God. Isn't that great? I mean, think about this. God's got this wired. I don't have to. I can be encouraged by the word of God. These things are right on time. The, the final thing this morning is it's warning. Um, now we're in chapter 5, the first three verses. Now, brothers, about the times and dates, we do not need to write you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. That is Jesus' word. Peter also uses that word. Thief in the night means like, you know, uh, as Jesus would have said, if you knew when the thief was coming, 
I'd be on that shady part of my, you know, of my porch with the shotgun. I'd be ready. So thief means nobody knows but God. In fact, when Jesus was asked about this on several occasions, um, he didn't know either. I find that fascinating. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come upon them suddenly. And the labor pains of a pregnant woman, they, they will not escape. You know, just to talk about that a minute, there's also there's false security and there's false signs. I was, uh, I, I was of a different thought at one point, and I was leading a prophecy of uh, uh, seminar, and, and this girl comes up and goes, wow, that was, I wasn't a pastor then, so I, you know, I, I wasn't under the ordination, so I was just teaching like a campus life director teaches, and she goes, wow, that's really fascinating, Jeff, man, I really liked all those signs and all that, she says, you know what, thank you so much for that teaching, um, it looks like I don't have to become a Christian until I see some of those things happen, and I went, oh, what kind of message? There's false securities and there's false destruction. So two things. Nobody will know. No one's going to know. Hey, you know, uh, I, I learned something about myself when I had teenagers. Because that, that, that critical moment when your teenagers can't drive, you know, so you become the human taxi. You know, you don't get paid for it. I can't speak with an accent or anything. So I come to the school, and, and I notice that the teenagers, because they, my, my girls needed a ride, they weren't so sure they wanted to be seen with Pastor Jeff sometimes. Just some days, you know. And it kind of did something funny in my heart. Because they wanted the ride, but they didn't love the appearing of their father. Ooh. See, we want the ride of God. We kind of want it to all figure out the way it works for us. We don't want to kind of, you know, duck down. Oh, there's some of our friends. I think I dropped a pencil on the floor, you know, the car and, and drive by. But see, Jesus wants us to love the appearing. That's why no one knows about this stuff. It's all just right there. You know, there's, there's just so much in here that, that's so powerful. And the second piece is this, everyone will be tempted. And what I mean by that is much of what is happening today that goes for prophecy is the same temptation of Adam and Eve. Did you know that? Have you ever put that together? What did Adam and Eve want in the garden? They wanted the mind of God. I want to know what God thinks. Well, see, if we could get that out of God, then we would have some kind of self-security about who we were, and God's just not ready to give that up. And just let me highlight that with this. The people in Jesus' time that had more Bible than anyone else, that had more temple than anyone else, that had more religion than anyone else, that had more time than anyone else, put their plan of how the first coming was going to happen. And they propagated those plans throughout the community so heavily that when Jesus actually came, not only did they miss him, they killed him. I just wonder if all of our finely articulated plans are going to go up in smoke the second time the way they did the first time, when it's so simple here to be encouraged with the word that we're being given. Application, here's that little piece of Peter in, in chapter 3. You, you want to read the whole chapter. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Paul's already said that. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Verse 11, 2 Peter chapter 3. It's the coordination to our verse 18. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought we to be? <clears throat> Not how much can we find out and get all laid out so we've got all our charts in. What kind of people? Two questions for you this morning as we close. What's the most important thing to you? 
what is the most important thing to you? I can help you with that. We are in church. That's all the hints I'm going to give you. <laughs> and it's not church. What's the most important thing? Are you living for that? Are you living for the most important thing? Are you taking your encouragement? Now, are we being the kind of people we ought to be in light of this great encouragement, in light of this blessed hope? Or have we forgot in the dark what we learned in the light? So when the darkness gets around us, we're like, <gasps> you've heard me use this illustration this, uh, enough, but I, I, I can't, I can't help but I'm close with it again anyway. If I could tell you this morning that Jesus is going to be back in seven days, and He's going to arrive right here simultaneously with the Mount of Olives and everyone else that has a, has a great destination for Jesus. How would you live the next seven days? What would you do? I think a lot of us might call in sick. You know? I might not, I might not get a sermon ready for you guys. But sorry. This is what this is all about. To get our eyes so on Jesus that we would live differently. And I know this wears off like the summer and you know, but, but Paul keeps saying, let's be, let's be the filling of our, of our hearts. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for, uh, we just thank you the blessed hope is the blessed hope 